as we pick up this study in Luke's Gospel, chapter 16 and verse 15, we find that Jesus is completely engaged with the religious leaders. And it's more than just a disagreement on religious views. Jesus has been taking them to task because of the hardness of their hearts. He's uncovering their actions and their motives, how it is that they're doing things. You see, what they're doing is they're misusing the law for personal gain, and they're doing so at the expense of others. And so he says in 15 that you are those who justify yourselves before men, but God knows your hearts. For what is highly esteemed among men is an abomination in the sight of God. Now, Jesus is bringing truth into a place where it's hard to find. The Pharisees were used to getting their own way without any opposition. They had held themselves up as the authority on all things that pertain to God and to His law. And for the most part, no one questioned them. For the most part, they went unchecked. And yet Jesus now has brought to light their hypocrisy by calling their actions an abomination before God. He knew that they would turn to the law because this is where they seek their justification. And so before they have opportunity, Jesus himself takes the lawyers to law school. And look what it says in verse 16. The law and the prophets were until John. And since that time, the kingdom of God has been preached and everyone is pressing into it. And it is easier for heaven and earth to pass away than for one tittle of the law to fail. Have any of you noticed that the law has a tendency to be a moving target? I mean, I mean have, you, have you noticed that today, to clearly identify something as being legal or illegal is, is kind of like trying to nail jello to the wall? I mean, there's, there's just so many things that, that are going on. Everyone wants the law to be on their side when it serves their purposes. And when it's not serving their purposes, they, they don't want there to be interaction of law or they don't want there to be some, some sort of, of observance of the law. It's interesting to see how the accusations of illegality are thrown out just at any whim and any cause. And we've seen probably more of that in the last three years than we have in the last... 50 or 100 years in any time has we ever seen so many people standing on one side of the aisle accusing the other side of the aisle and it doesn't matter what side you're on of breaking the law it's illegal what they're doing is illegal but yet when we see it come out we find that there's never any or sufficient evidence to prosecute let alone convict I mean, how many times have we got it excited about somebody potentially being held responsible and accountable for what they've done only to find nothing happens? It just doesn't get accounted for. And it's easy enough to just accuse. It's easy enough to, to call out that someone is doing something illegal and there's not even any ramifications if you make that claim and later it's found that there was no substantiation in the claim whatsoever. So we've kind of lost our our compass and relationship to this whole aspect of what is legal and what isn't. But one thing that you can be sure of, when those in power use the law for personal, personal or political gain, we're the ones that pay the price. The Pharisees were masters at interpreting the law of God to their advantage. And they used it to justify and protect their interests. If there was some advantage that they sought to apply to their lives, they would simply create, justify, modify, manipulate a law in order to make it as if they were compelled and forced to do it. They would make the claim that because the law came from God and because the law is of God, then the things that they are promoting as law, they don't have a choice. God demands that we give ourselves a raise. God demands that we do these things in His name. We, we're just His humble servants, and so therefore, because of these legal demands, we have to comply. There's no way that these guys were going to accept what Jesus was saying. He says that the law wasn't until John. John who? John the Baptist. But now the kingdom of God is here. Why all of a sudden is the kingdom of God present before them? If For no other reason, obviously, than the fact that Jesus is standing in front of them. 
saying, until I showed up, says Jesus, it was right for you to look to the law. The law was the means by which you received the covering through sacrifice. But now that I'm here, you no longer have an exclusive hold on the kingdom of God. And this would have been the part that bothered them more than anything else. You see, again, the lawyers, the Pharisees, the scribes, those that were the religious leaders, had complete authority and control over the law. The law was written in Hebrew. Most of the common man didn't even read Hebrew. If they spoke anything, it was Aramaic. If they read anything, maybe Aramaic. They couldn't read the law. They couldn't interpret it. So if the Pharisee told you something, you just had to nod and agree. That must be what it says, because I don't have the ability to understand. But now Jesus has said, since the kingdom of God is here, guess what? Everybody's pressing in on it. Everybody has got accessibility to it. Everybody. Can you imagine how upsetting this would have been to the, to the Pharisees to think that now something that they had cornered the market on was available to everybody? They couldn't have been happy. But you guys realize that's the same access that we have to God. You guys recognize that there's not anybody in the world that has more access to God than you do, right? God doesn't answer my phone calls any quicker than he answers yours. Matter of fact, he probably screens mine more than he screens yours. All right? there, there's, there's no superiority, but this was the, the playing field. This was the arena that Jesus stepped into because as he moved into this, this place, these guys had established a kingdom on their own. They had established that they were the purveyors of the law. They were the ones and if Jesus was doing anything, he was breaking the law. He was violating the law or calling for its abandonment altogether. How dare you say that the law was and is no longer? And Jesus corrects them immediately. He says, I'm not calling for an abolishment of the law. I'm not calling for an abandonment of the law. I'm not calling for us to, to disregard the law in any way. He says, the difference is <laughs> I'm here to fulfill the law oh again this was something that they couldn't understand they couldn't in any way shape or form get their heads around you see this aspect of the law being fulfilled has created a lot of debate it's created a a, a lot of aspect of, of of how it is that that we can possibly look at the the law anymore as being valid or having any part of our lives In the church, especially in our modern time, knowing that we are in this dispensation, this time of grace, there's been a lot that has looked upon the law as something as being irrelevant, as being not any longer applicable to our lives, applicable to us as Christians. How many of you in here have heard that since Jesus came, everything according to the law changed? How many of you? Yeah, oh yeah everything changed. Well, maybe not. Maybe what we need to do is we need to understand that there's not this aspect of the law versus the grace or grace versus the law, that there's this opportunity for the law and for grace to work together perfectly, and it's through Jesus Christ and the fulfilling of the law that we see this take place. And so this morning, I want to take just a, a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah, we've got a little bit of time. Of course, this is the third service, which means as long as we're out by three, that's okay, right? I had a lot of points I wanted to make in the first two services I didn't get to make, so you guys are really smart for coming to this service. <laughs> Anytime that there's a conflict, it's because there are different points of view in relationship to an issue or some set of circumstances. And in this case, the idea of the law versing grace, we find a lot of different views even within the church. And I don't want to go through a lot, I just want to camp on a couple of them here. One side says that salvation is by grace and by grace alone. How many of you like that one? I like that. All right. And there's no real inference or reference going forward as to what that means in, in reference to the law. It's just we want to live and we want to camp out on grace. And because grace is cool and grace is good and we need a lot of it, that's where we want to live. But then there's others that will say, but wait a minute, if you only focus on grace and if you do so at the expense of the law, if you abandon the law, then it leads to lawlessness, to anarchy. Not only does it lead to anarchy, but it cheapens and diminishes the grace of God. And so by all means, you can't cast it out completely. There has to be some mix. And then we have the centrist. 
The person in the middle that says, well, salvation is by grace, but you can only have grace if you follow the law. So what do we do? As believers, how do we find out which is right? How do we find out what it is that we're supposed to do in relationship to balancing grace and balancing the law in our lives? How do we know what's right? Well, if I get to choose, I'll choose grace for me and law for you every time. Wouldn't you? I mean, I, I, I think I can control myself enough to operate under grace. I don't know about you guys. And see, and that's the problem. The problem is, is that there, there has to be something that makes this work. So we've got to break it down to the point that we understand, first, what are we talking about? When we talk about the law, what does that mean? When we go to the Scripture and we say the law of Moses or the law that was given, what are we talking about? Well, it all begins with the Ten Commandments. It all begins with the law that was given to Moses by God, recorded in Exodus 20, where God provided the standard for a holy people. And he gave ten commands which laid out three different categories of law. There's a category for civil law and for ceremonial law and then for moral law. In ten commands. Can you imagine if all you had to follow was ten laws? <laughs> Do you know how many laws, rules, regulations, and statutes are on the books in this state, let alone this county? I mean, they have to regulate every stupid act that anybody's ever done in order to hopefully not have them do that again. I've read some laws, and I look at that, and I say, how stupid do you have to be? I mean, it, it, who, who, could ever, who would ever do this? But obvious, someone at least answered the call to be that stupid at least once because <laughs> they had to write a law against it ever happening again. And so hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of rules and regulations and statutes piled on in order for there to be this control exercise over the heart and the behaviors of people. But see, the law was given by God to create a separation between His people and other peoples of the world. He wanted His people to know what His standard was. He also wanted to be able to clearly define sin. But the, the greatest thing that the law has accomplished in its giving is to identify that even if we only have to follow ten, we can't. We can't. There's only 10 laws. None of them are suggestions or recommendations. But we can't follow 10. And so it doesn't matter how many more we add if we fail with the first 10. What the first 10 represent and, and, and give us is the fact that we have to then have relief from the law. And that relief comes through the salvation that we receive through Jesus Christ. We need a Savior. We can't comply with the law, and so therefore we need something and someone to step in between us and the law that we cannot comply with and relieve us of the debt that violating that law creates. By the time Jesus showed up, the religious leaders had completely hijacked God's law, and they added all kinds of rules and regulations of their own. And as far as they were concerned, the law was great. Those first ten laws, they were good, but they were incomplete. You see, they didn't regulate every human behavior. They didn't take into this consideration and that consideration and this circumstance and what happens when A and B is happening but not C. And then all of a sudden, you've got to have all of these different variations. This was the legalistic arena that Jesus stepped into when he confronted these guys. They were the experts. They had built a kingdom around using God's law and justifying it on the same. Jesus now on the scene represents a terrible threat to their way of life. And the lawyers, without even really being prepared, are about to be taken to school by the law giver. Oh, it's interesting when confronted with somebody with superior knowledge. Now, some of you guys know that I spent about 14 years of my life in prison. I worked there. I was on the catch and release program. <laughs> but we had a program years ago that was called Scared Straight. How many of you remember seeing the national version of that? Yeah, and we were part of that, 
that whole thing to where we brought in at-risk youth and kids that were juvenile delinquents and headed down the wrong path getting involved in gangs. And the idea was to do exactly as the title portrayed, to bring them in and introduce them to the real bad guys before they became real bad guys and scare them straight. That was the whole purpose of the thing. And it was pretty, pretty intense. But there were also, from time to time, these youngsters that would show up that were just so hard and they had such an attitude that you could tell the minute that they hit the door, man, they were all about, ah, you got nothing for me. And they would sit there and they'd cross their arms and they'd roll their eyes. And one day this young 15-year-old kid came in and he was mouthy, man. He was talking all kinds of smack and he was, he was going to do this and he was all about this. And he started telling everybody in the room about how he was connected to the original OG, the original old gangster, the guy that founded the L.A. Crips. And not only was he connected, he was related. He was a blood relation. And it is kind of funny when you think about a crip talking about a blood, but that's another story. <laughs> and he's mouthing off, and he's talking about, I ain't afraid of nothing, I ain't afraid of nobody, I got my, my people going to take care of me, and because I'm related to so-and-so and this guy and that guy, and you know, I can even come to prison, man, and I'm going to do fine, and nobody's going to touch me, right? And he's all sitting, he's all proud of himself and all puffed up. So he's sitting down in a chair, and about halfway through the session, one of the guys goes over and makes his way, and he sits next to him, and he's just kicking it with him. He's just talking to him, you know, trying to get his story, find out all this great connection he's got. Hey, well, you know, who, who are your people, and who's this, and who's that? Wow, my, wow, you're connected. Dude, man, <laughs> yeah, you're the real deal. And then it became that inmate's turn to get up and talk, right? And he got up, and he introduced himself. Guess who it was? It was the OG himself, <laughs> the very man that this kid had named as being a blood relative that he didn't even know was sitting right next to him the whole time. After turning three shades of green, I believe the young man relieved himself, and then <laughs> everything changed in the room. And that guy looked at that kid, and he said, I don't know you, and you don't know me, but you come here, and we're going to get to know each other real well. And everything, and see, this is about the same thing that's happening in this room with these Pharisees. You see, they don't realize who they're talking to. And they're talking all this smack, and they're talking all this bravado. We got the law, and we're the interpreters of the law, and we know what the law is, and we know all this stuff. And Jesus walks in and goes, wait a minute, <laughs> I wrote the law. I'm the one that wrote it. So there's a difference in this whole setting. They're not going to receive what Jesus is bringing. And yet, he entertains them. And he says, here's the thing. You want me to be a lawbreaker. You're trying to catch me in a violation. You want me to say that the law does not support what it is that I'm prescribing. But let me tell you what I'm doing. I'm not breaking it. I'm not abolishing it. I'm not making it of no use. I'm here to fulfill it. Jesus stands up and introduces to them the concept of grace that comes into perfect harmony with the law. See, the law came through Moses. And through Moses, we know that there was this entire process of them learning how to perfect themselves before God. And then Jesus shows up on the scene, and he brings this aspect of grace. And somehow or another, very often in the church, we think that they're exclusive. We're thinking that the law and the grace are incompatible. But Jesus says, no, 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 they're not incompatible. They come together perfectly. It's a matter of which one comes first. You see, for the Jew, the law came first. And then perfection after, based upon compliance with the law. When Jesus came, he says, what comes first is grace. And then because of grace, obedience is empowered by the Holy Spirit. You see, it isn't that the law doesn't apply. It's how we apply it, when we apply it, that matters. For those that will say that everything changed with Jesus, that when Jesus came, the law went away and the law no longer applies and everything changed. Nothing could be further from the truth. The law didn't change. Jesus himself said, not one tittle will, will pass from the law. The tittle is, is, is the smallest 
punctuation mark. Jesus didn't say, yeah, forget the law. No, no, no. The law remains. But it didn't change. You see, the nature of God didn't change. How many of you realize that God didn't change His character with Jesus Christ? God was full of grace before Jesus. God showed grace all through the Old Testament. Oh, well, yeah, but He's wrathful and he's, and he's vengeful and He's doing it. If you've been here on Wednesday nights, we've been studying Jeremiah. Man, God's cutting loose on, on, on Judah. But even within it, we see over and over and over and over again that His grace is equal to His justice. So God's always been a God of great grace. He's also been a God that accepts people's faith as making them worthy of salvation. How many of you in here know that we're saved by grace through faith? It's our faith, and only by the grace of God. If it wasn't by His grace, then we would boast about it, right? Well, guess what? Everybody that has ever been saved, everyone that will ever be in heaven, all those Old Testament folks before Jesus Christ that we wonder, how in the world are they going to get there? The same way we do, by faith. Abraham was accounted worthy because of his faith. You see, it hasn't changed. Faith isn't a new concept that, that only came on the scene with Jesus Christ and the grace that he brought. God hasn't changed his approach. The same God that gave the law is the same God that gave us Jesus Christ. Even within the law, even within the sacrificial system, there was great grace. I mean, think about it. Israel needing to have this burden of sin lifted and no means and no ways of being able to do it. And God gives them the law and they look at the law and they go, great, we can't keep it. Now what? Oh, God's grace says, here's a sacrificial system that you can use. See, that was grace. See, we look at the sacrificial system, we think, what bondage. What a hassle to have to kill all kinds of animals and shed their blood in order to have your blood, your, your, your sins covered just from week to week. And we've talked about how that is. Man, you can come into church. What if we had to do that here and you bring in something, you, and you cut it, and we sacrifice it? You go out in the parking lot, and before you get out of the parking lot, somebody cuts you off, and you get mad, and you sin, and you, oh, man, another goat. Whole new meaning to the word, got your goat, huh? <laughs> Even in the sacrificial system, though, though it was God's grace allowing them to be relieved of the burden of their sin. Jesus was born under the law, and he brought with him just in his presence and through his sacrifice the fulfillment of that requirement for a sacrifice when he himself became the perfect sacrifice for all of mankind the law could not and will not make anyone righteous but christ's sacrifice has sufficed for all so here's where things start to come together. Here's where we start to understand. And I want you to listen carefully because you need to understand that there is no conflict between the grace of God and the law of God. It's not grace or law. Not when it's properly understood and when it's properly applied. Christ fulfilled the law on our behalf. And then He gave us the power of the Holy Spirit to walk in obedience. And the same power, the same grace that has the power to save has the same power and the needed power in order for us to walk and turn away from sin and walk in a godly direction. It's true. We are saved by grace. Through faith in Jesus Christ. That's the way salvation comes. Keeping the law can't save, won't save. And anybody that claims righteousness because they follow a certain set of doctrines or a certain set of laws is just deceiving themselves. But the conflict between grace and law, if it is, is only there because of misunderstanding. When we misunderstand the purpose of the law is to bring us to Jesus Christ, then we misuse the law. If we re redefine grace as something other than God's unmerited favor, then we do cheapen the grace of God if we take a license with that grace 
to sin. Anytime that we try to earn salvation, add to the finished work of Jesus Christ, any of our works, then we are misusing, misrepresenting the grace of God. Anytime we fail to focus on the whole counsel of God's Word and instead turn to man's doctrines or man-made traditions in order to try to fulfill some religious obligation once again, we have misused the grace of God. So where does law come in? Well, it's real simple. When we come to the place of salvation, when we receive Jesus Christ by grace through faith, we no longer have a desire to break the law. God desires that when we come to Jesus Christ by faith in His grace, that we would then produce good works. You see, the Jews tried to do works in order to receive grace. We have been freely given grace, and on the backside, the Lord says, hey, I want you to do something with that. And any believer in Jesus Christ should be one who is moving towards works, good works in Jesus Christ. So don't get hung up. It's not the law or grace. It's that Jesus Christ fulfilled the law by grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, we thank you. And Lord, we are just so thrilled to be here today. And Lord, we ask that you would just continue to guide and to direct and to lead us in your grace, knowing, Lord, that our obedience to you is not because it's commanded, but because of the great gratitude, the, the thankfulness that we have. Oh, it's your love that compels us, that restrains us from doing that which would violate your law. Lord, we want to do things that are right, and we want to do them for the right reasons, not selfish gain or personal ambition, but Lord, because of your great grace. So Lord, we thank you. We praise you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.